Interestingly, Albania appears to have not been severely impacted by this crisis. I, since I know nothing about the Albanian economy, I'm intrigued by that, that reality. Yeah. So what were the principal impacts of the crisis? Well, of course, we saw a dramatic fall off in export trade from the region. We also saw inward FDI from outside dropping because, of course, companies, multinational companies are investing less in the region and therefore we're seeing less of that. We saw severe credit rationing. Um, you know, just if you walk around the city, you, all you see now are advertisements for savings accounts, whereas two years ago they were bending over backwards to sell you a, an exotic yen financing facility for your uh, <coughs> renovation of your 15th apartment or whatever. Yeah. And as I said, we had our currency crises. You, you, may, you may have heard what was going on in Latvia. Uh, Latvia was particularly impacted by the crisis. Uh, at one point, I think the numbers are getting better, but at one point they were predicting a 15% drop in GDP in 2009, you know, which is severe. I mean, that's that, that, that is a cratering of the economy. We've seen rising unemployment, very, very high consumer debt default. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people who took out those Swiss franc car loans can't pay them back, so the cars get taken back. Last time I was in Bucharest, I was driving from the airport, you know, the, the worst road in Central Eastern Europe from the airport to uh, Central Bucharest, and they have a bunch of used car dealerships. And in one used car dealership, there were seven Bugattis lined up next to each other. I, I, I assume some uh, successful Romanian entrepreneurs had to give the, give the keys back um, to the owners. And we've also seen uh, rising government indebtedness as well, uh, partially related, of course, to these IMF packages that have come in. Um, this, this looks at exchange rate devaluation. You can see that Slovakia here actually had an exchange rate appreciation. That was because of joining the euro. Typically currencies, as they join the euro, see a net appreciation of their currency. That's just a, a phenomenon of that. But you can see, for example, U Ukraine Rivna dropped substantially. The, the Zwoty in Poland fell. But you can see across the board, more or less, we saw net devaluations against the euro. Right? Now, again, just think back to economics. Uh, the old-fashioned paradigm that I've now been told about. Um, what, hap what happens to your exports if your currency becomes cheaper uh, in your trading partners? In theory, you should start exporting more, right? Because your export prices go down. Right? This is the so-called J-curve effect. So what we see is, you know, for a while they drop, and then after a while they start rising. We haven't quite seen that yet, um, but we'll see what happens. This is the growth of domestic credit. You know, I mentioned the, the housing issue in, in Ukraine. Huge amounts of borrowing uh, to finance real estate purchases. At the height of the, um, of the bubble in, in, in downtown Kiev, you could get apartments for more than 12,000 euros per square meter. Right? Which is insane, uh, given the economic fundamentals of, of, of Ukraine. I guess if you're an oligarch, though, I guess you can afford it. Because you've got, you know, you own lots of companies that you acquired spontaneously when th the country collapsed. Um, you can see Romania had a problem, but again, across the board, um, domestic credit has increased. Current account deficits. Why does Russia have a current account surplus? Oil, yeah. Oil and gas. Hopefully they won't switch it off again this winter like they did last winter. <laughs> I think the Ukrainians and the Russians have made a deal with each other. Timoshenko and uh, Putin had a meeting. I think they're okay. So with the exception of Russia, again, across the board, growing deficits um, as we end transition, as we uh, hit, get hit by the crisis. So really, when this crisis is over, we just cannot expect a return to the old ways. Now, we can't expect to see these growth rates that we experienced up until the end of transition. Yeah. And also, for, don't forget that every single member state of the European Union that's from Central Eastern Europe that hasn't adopted the euro yet, all right, they're committed to further deflationary pressure to get inflation down, to get budget deficits down, to get interest rates down. So the government's stimulus possibilities are significantly lower than they were during the transition process. So don't look to the government to spend money to sort of kickstart the economy because there's no money there because they're indebted. And secondly, the European Central Bank will sanction them if they don't meet the, con uh, the convergence criteria to join the euro, to which they are by treaty committed. So what should companies do? Well, 
companies need to shift their entire growth strategies from what we call extensive growth, which is growing into the growing market, and focus more on intensive growth. Right? And there's two elements to intensive growth for companies. Number one, keep your existing customers rather than your glorious pursuit of new customers. All right? So you redefine your targets for your managers, your sales managers. You say, we're not going to pay you more if you get more customers. We're going to pay you more if you keep existing customers happy. All right? <coughs> So you have to be more monogamous with your customers rather than uh, encouraging them to have five bank accounts each, which is what happens in the banking sector, for example. Right. And related to that focus on intensive growth are two things. In the B2C sector, uh, a relentless and tireless focus on customer service. Right. So my favorite Hungarian expression, Shainos nem tudok segíteni. You're all laughing because you hear it every single day of your life and you know it. That has to come to an end. We cannot continue this nonsense because in a maturing market, you will lose market share if you keep doing that nonsense. Believe me. And the second thing in your B2B sector, customer relationship management. Uh, an, an, an intense focus on that because again, if when you start competing with each other to get each other's customers, CRM is going, to be, is going to be the thing that keeps you there. And as I say, an interesting reality is, is that most of you have only ever experienced growth. You've never been trying to win business in a mature market. And that's what you face in the silver era um, ahead. That's on the customer side, you know, the front end, if, if you like. If you look at the, you know, you look at the inter internal organizational aspects, uh, and my colleague Zoltan Buzadi at the back will be very happy to hear this, who's our uh, uh, HRM professor. Um, right now, most companies, uh, human resources is an operational function. It's about filling in the bits of paper, signing in blue ink in triplicate, and making sure that you, as a company, abide by labor laws. What needs to happen in the future is a strategic approach to HR, which Professor Buzadi knows a lot more about than I do, um, which is focusing on putting your HR manager on the board of directors of your companies. And a, a recent survey shows that very few companies in this region have their, eight, their senior HR officer on the board of directors. And that needs to change. Because it's your human resources that are going to be able to win the new customers from your competitors in this rapidly maturing marketplace. Um, and I think on a strategic level you need to think about two things. Focus on the intangible value that comes to customers rather than the tangible value. So if you work in the mobile phone business, it's not just about selling a new handset and a two-year contract. It's about every single time your customer calls into the call center, they, put, they end the conversation saying, that was really good, that was easy, or well, that worked, or that person was really helpful and very friendly and I got what I needed done quickly. So intangible value rather than tangible value. And focus on your distinctive competences or if you have a particular technology, look for ways in which you can form strategic alliances with companies to develop those technologies, those competences. So don't look at yourself as an individual competitor. Find ways in which cooperation, legal cooperation, not illegal cooperation, uh, can work. And the last point, which I haven't really got to, but I guess it's, this, it's the business in society piece. I like, I like what Stuart said there. Um, Hungary is not <laughs> unique in this, but there's a corruption problem in this country, and it needs to be stopped. As, as long as we continue to accept corruption at every single level of our society, be it in the private and public sector, we are going to be wasting resources that can be more effectively used in a transparent way. Um, so those of you who, who set up companies to not pay taxes, you're contributing to corruption. And yes, it's true that the Prime Minister does the same. Oh, sorry. Sorry. It's true that the, the leaders of this country do the same thing, but that has to stop. Because if you look at economic performance and corruption, there's a very clear correlation that countries that are corrupt underperform economically. And worse than that, the distribution of income among the people in that society is worse because people who are corrupt don't, di don't disclose their income and therefore people who have, a ch have fewer economic opportunities because of that. So I think... Uh, that's all I want to say. Um, are there any questions?